Look at this forest. It's dark. Would you say very European? You could probably imagine Little Red Riding Hood going in and out of the trees here. Maybe Hansel and Gretel. Honestly, this dense forest seems to be the setting for almost every European fairy tale. And it's because of this tree, the spruce. But I'm here to tell you that this image of a classically European forest is a bit of a myth. Historically, this is not what the forest should look like, meaning it's not a wild forest. It, people planted monocultures of just these trees because they're really valuable trees. But now they're dying in a mass. This is not a normal clear cut to simply harvest trees. This didn't result in wealth, quite the opposite. What you're seeing here is an attempt to clean up death happening on a massive scale across Europe. It is a catastrophe. The owners of this land lost millions, and yet it could have all been prevented. Anyone who looks after a forest, even in their own backyard, can learn from what is happening in Europe here, because it's probably going to happen in every overly dense forest in the world soon enough. And that's exactly why we're here to find solutions from ground zero, to find people who've figured it out. So we start here in the beautiful country of Czechia in Central Europe. We made it to Czechia. That, what, is, that, is that what they say, Czechia? Czechia. Czechia, Česko. Yuri here is my friend and the world's leading bark beetle expert. So you're like the leading world's expert. Right? I can't say it. But okay. viewers is. can see. He's spending a year here with his family looking at this problem of bark beetles. Now, Prague is the capital of Czechia and it's where we're starting our journey, but it's not where Yuri is from. It's not where his true love really is. I'm attached to the dirt here. Yuri was born here. He grew up in the country. Summer nights I spent on that balcony in a sleeping bag. We were treated to dinner with his family on the farm. The punishment for the fox for having eaten all their chickens is they killed it, stuffed it, and it is as undignified as you see it there. <laughs> like a cartoon, smoking a pipe. It's it, was, it was actually And they're really proud of their son, Yuri, the professor. Then the home movies came out. That's Yuri working the fields when he was a kid with his family. And even today, it's clear being in nature and in the fields or on the hunt for beetles feels more like home for Yuri. All this background on Yuri is important because he had a real revelation, especially after these headlines started coming out. Many of these headlines imply the current die-offs are a beetle problem, which is exactly why Yuri is here. In fact, he came to study these very beetles. But it turns out this is a native beetle. It's been around for thousands of years and it's only able to infest weak spruce trees. A healthy spruce tree you see produces enough resin that the tree can kill the beetle and thus it normally causes no problem at all. They're only killing off stressed trees and the main stressor right now is drought, which is related to the higher than normal summer temperatures. Yuri explained it real simply to us when we found a forest of dead spruce trees. This is a bark beetle outbreak site, a real drama. You can see how it unfolded. If you start over there, you see it started. All, it all started there. And folks who were managing this still had some time to try to stop it, meaning that they're cutting down the trees, peeling the bark off, taking them away. This was three years ago. You see already bushes growing there. This was probably last year or two years ago when the front was advancing. The bark beetles, the clouds of bark beetles coming out from the, the trees behind us were chewing on these other ones. Folks are still trying to manage it, cutting it down. They seem to not have enough time or manpower to take it out. So the next generation of bark beetles emerged from these logs and attacked those trees. Nobody had any time to do anything with that. They're toast. Bark beetles are not usually the cause of death. Bark beetles finish trees, but they usually don't start the process of death. So rather than us just thinking about how to kill them, how to kill them, let's think about why it's happening. Why are we seeing suddenly now these big explosions of bark beetle cause mortality? What happened to these trees? Rather than thinking about beetles as the mean cause of death, Let's think about them as a symptom of tree condition. More simply, he realized it's not a beetle problem. It's a spruce problem. 
And more directly, the problem is that monocultures were planted for centuries, and now we're getting hit by an outbreak of epic proportions. They're killing huge forests of trees. So my main question was, is there any way around this catastrophe? Or do we have to just plan for the end of forests in the future? My hopes hinged on a privately owned forest that was in the middle of a transition. It's owned by the Duke, Kinski. We met him here at a chateau in central Czechia. It's not only a business, but it is a business. Uh, so anything we do has to pay for itself. Uh, if you talk about sustainability, for example, which is a big buzzword, uh, uh, we always say that sustainability has three pillars. One is ecological, working with nature and protecting it. The second one is economical. If it doesn't pay, it's not going to survive and I need to make a living. And the third thing is sociopolitical. If it doesn't carry meaning for society at large, society will turn its back on you. And again, it won't be sustainable. If you build on those three pillars, you're fine. You're doing something that's really meaningful and will live on. You would need to include in the storyboard the, the monoculture, dark, uh, same trees, same size, uh, same height. Uh, da, da, da. That's what we started from in 1994 and we're already at this stage and I can explain right. sort of going round what we've been doing. Yeah, let's walk. Then he showed us how he's adding trees to his forest to help make them stronger and more resistant to the beetles which in the end protect his investments. You have a slot where we've created a half hectare hole where we have planted beech. So we are reintroducing a species that belongs here, but because this was monoculture, had basically disappeared. So in a sense, we are returning the forest closer to its natural mix, which here is well, spruce, fir and beech in various proportions. There's just you know, a touch of diversity. He then explained how they're thinning trees, actually with these animals. Right behind me now, they're using horses to help the forest stay healthy and actually increases profit. It's amazing how little damage the horses do. That's impressive to me. So it was very dense. And what we've done is take out 20%, yeah? Every, every fifth tree. And we've taken out those, in priority, those that were sick and contaminating the others. And then you do the extreme, you took the, those that are the best, where you make the most money and you leave 75-80% of the trees. And this tree, the Norway spruce, has the, the ability to take advantage of any space you give it. So this tree probably was you know, that big before when we start, and it's adding inches and inches and inches of wood. It has the ability to react, even irrespective of its age, to react to space, to light, to the availability of, of water and continue to grow. So if you leave the average tree, you turn it into a great tree at no cost. And finally, he explained that it's not just a long-term game. He's also making this work in the short term. Short term, there will be more cash flow if you do it right. It also feels more natural. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what makes it really, uh, it feels, feels more alive, you know? This forest that Kinski runs was kind of amazing. It showed us clearly that with smart management, a long-term view of the forest, and with someone who loves the forest, you can make it all work better. We then visited the University Enterprise Forest a few hours away in Moravia. Here, they're conducting research to try to design the best forestry practices for the current world we live in. We change the forests, definitely, for the future, because this is the main role of the university forest, to be the light on the end of the tunnel, as we say in, in our country. Tomas is a character who grew up under the Iron Curtain in the old communist days. In those days, they had planted all spruce monocultures, and he's now working to change them, to save the forests. And to him, saving these forests is not only practical, because he does have to pay for the entire enterprise, it also has meaning to him personally. Forest means for me at first beauty, at second gift from God. One of the main forestry techniques they found that has important utility is this concept of a diversified forest, not just a monoculture. 
I don't know if you can see it in the drone footage here, but these forests are not all the same height, nor are they all the same species. That's a definition of a healthy working forest. And it's working for everyone. Little trees growing underneath a big trees. That's a stump right here I'm standing on. They took out the big tree and now it's being processed in a sawmill for a kitchen table. Behind us, we hear the chainsaws. They're working here. Just there, just as we came in, there was a wild boar. And on the other side of the path was a deer. It's working for animals. And if you listen, there's a ton of birds. This structured, diverse, diversified forest is an incredible thing. It works for everyone. And finally, to wrap our heads around the current threat of this beetle apocalypse destroying the forests, we visited the largest historic beetle outbreak site of the last 20 years, just over the border in Bavaria. We are in Germany. This is all spruce habitat, all dead spruce right here. It's pretty incredible. You could still see massive standing dead trees killed over a decade before. But unlike the other sites we went to, nobody harvested these trees. They were just left as a bit of a natural experiment. And the people feared here, trees will not regrow. You see by your own, this is not a question. So the point is that humans really created a perfect habitat for one insect species. Jörg was right. We saw it everywhere. These monocultures of spruce trees across Europe are the perfect place for beetle outbreaks. In hot years, the beetles have a literal buffet in front of them. So Jörg and the researchers here found the same results that Tomas did in the south and that Kinski was practicing in his forest. They found that the diversity of the forest is the key to making it resilient to the unpredictable climate and thus to the beetles. The takeaway seemed simple. First, like Yuri discovered, it's not a beetle problem, it's a spruce problem. A monoculture is just super risky, but it's more than that. The spruce monoculture is in trouble because the climate is changing. The one thing we know for certain, it seems, is that we don't really know what the climate will be when the trees planted today are 100 years old. And that means the key to it all and to a healthy forest is to have diversity in sizes and species of trees. If you mix the, the dimension of trees, if you mix the tree species, then you will not experience a huge outbreak. And Jörg wanted us to see this, so he sent us up a 50 meter tower in the center of the forest. And from here, you could see the new growth. This was all what looked like death and destruction, and the forest has rejuvenated. And there are very few outbreaks these days, and it's now way more diverse. And that's what every one of these people came up with, from the researchers to the hardcore foresters and the businessmen. It seems evident that these caretakers will make their forest work for them now and in the future. And these are important lessons, as we need this renewable resource in the future. So back to those dense spruce forests at the beginning of the video. We introduce them as a myth because they're not actually historic forests that anyone should strive to have. They're not diverse native forests that can stand the test of time, you see. Instead, today, they're a buffet for beetles. So our hope is that in the future, nobody's gonna look at these spruce monocultures and think that's how things should be. Instead, maybe the ideal is this mixed native forest because not only is it better for the financial success of the stewards, but also for everyone else. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that little film. No matter where you are in the world, I feel like there are things we can learn from this story. And I get that every forest is unique. So if you have questions about this beetle, the lumber industry, or you want more detailed look at the solutions, this is part of a bigger campaign that you can see at climatebeetle.org, something we put together with 360 degree videos and even other films like this beautiful cinematic film, which I'm leaving a link to right here. Definitely check that out and thanks for watching.